Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. We're very excited to be here with Omar El Alcad. Did I say that right? You did. Yeah. Good. I, I butcher everybody's last names. So. Um, we have a very, very exciting virtual girly book club because we have a very exciting book and a very interesting author. So I'm very excited to be here with you tonight. Uh, American War was um, the book that we read this month. Uh, it is set in 2075, so very interesting storyline that if you haven't read it yet, then we might be spoiling it for you tonight. So <laughs> maybe, maybe if you're listening to this as a recording, press pause, go finish the book and come back. <laughs> um, so just a little bit of background about our lovely author. Um, Omar was born in Cairo, Egypt, and he grew up in Doha, um, Qatar, before moving to Canada with his family. He's an award-winning journalist and author who has traveled around the world to cover many of the most important news stories of the last decade. His reporting includes dispatches from NATO-led war in Afghanistan and the military trials of Guantanamo Bay, the Arab Spring Revolution in Egypt, and the Black Lives Matter movement in Fergus, um, sorry, Ferguson. He's a recipient of Canada's National Newspaper Award for Investigations and the Goff Penny Memorial Prize for Young Canadian Journalists, as well as three National Magazine Award honorable mentions. So that's a pretty, uh, pretty impressive uh, bio, Omar. <laughs> I've, um, since American War came out, I don't want to brag or anything, but American War has so far lost 14 different awards. So just throwing that out there. Wow. I'm super well-versed okay. and smiling I'm, and clapping as somebody else wins an award. I'm writing this down for, for further um, conversation. So tonight, just before we dig in, we have four chances to win in our fabulous giveaway that Book Trib has sponsored. And the four books we're going to be giving away are The Whisper Network, Beautiful Bad, A Palm Beach Wife, and Captain No Beard. A uh, little bit of a different, <laughs> a different book. We've got a child's book. So if you have children, then I hope they will enjoy it. And if not, you're welcome to give it away to a friend or someone. Um, and the way that you will win is we'll be asking questions to see how closely you're following, what is going on. And uh, you can email the answers. It will be in the chat window. Valerie will be looking after that. Um, and you get all four of them. And there's four of them. So that's a pretty good, uh, that's a pretty good gift, I think. All right. So let's start this off um, with you, Omar. If you can just give us a little bit of back. Well, we, we know your background. But talk to us about how you became an author. Sure, yeah. Um... So I, I, um, I've been an immigrant since the age of five. I was five years, I was born in Egypt and at the age of five, uh, my father couldn't find work in Egypt and um, he found a job in this place called Qatar, which most people in this part of the world um, can't point out on a map. It's this tiny little peninsula sticking out of Saudi Arabia. Um, and at the time, which would have been the mid eighties, um, they'd only recently stumbled on what would end up being the third largest natural gas reserves in the world. Uh, so it was on its way to becoming one of the richest places on earth and they needed uh, people. They needed people to do all the work because Qatar's population, native born population is tiny. Um, so I moved there when I was five um, and I lived there for the next 11 years and then I moved to Canada. Now I live in the US. Um, so long story short, I'm, I, I've, I'm not one of those people who has a very good answer to the question, where are you from? Um, and so I've sort of been drawn to fiction from a young age because you get to um, define the contours of, of your world uh, to fit whatever, you know, what, however you define yourself. Um, so I've been writing since a very young age. Um, I went to school for computer science, which was a horrible idea, uh, no good at it, but at, um, at Queens in, in Kingston uh, in Ontario. Uh, but I spent all my time at the student newspaper. And so, um, I graduated with zero knowledge of computer science, but with a pretty decent uh, portfolio. And I ended up getting an internship at the Globe and Mail, and I was there for the next 10 years. Um, so I found a way to, to sort of get close to what I wanted to do with my life uh, and get paid to do it, uh, but I wasn't quite, quite there. Uh, I was writing fiction the whole time. I, um, I wrote three novels before American War. Uh, I wrote them in my spare time when I was working at the Globe, and none of them were, were any good uh, and so I never showed them to anybody or tried to get them published or anything like that. Uh, and I was going to do the same with American War. American War was never going to leave the hard drive. And then I had a bad day at work. 
uh, had one of those days where I felt like I was just rewriting press releases. And I thought, to hell with this. Um, and I emailed it to a literary agent who I'd met by accident uh, eight years earlier. She agreed to take it on. She agreed to take me on as a client. And three months after that, we'd sold it to Knopf in New York. And um, I quit my job and kind of jumped off the cliff and, and hoped there was water at the bottom sort of thing. But um, fiction's been my home since, since a very young age. It's, it's one of the few places where I feel comfortable. So your career itself sounded like unbelievable. Um, can you talk to us? Like, I feel like it has a lot to do with what you write about, even though you're not writing um, nonfiction. Can you talk to us a little bit about um, your career as a journalist? Yeah, I mean, my career was unbelievable, largely because I have no real skills. Um, you know, engineers have actual skills. They know how to do things. Journalists, not so much. Um, it was an, it, what it was was an incredible education. Um, I got to go see places that otherwise I would have never been able to see. Uh, I got to go to Afghanistan during the NATO invasion. Uh, I got to go to Guantanamo to cover the, the military trials. Um, I, I got to sort of get a firsthand education in, in the world as it was working in real time. Um, and I got to write about it, which, which is sort of a really fascinating way to learn about, about the world. Um, when it's going well, journalism is really, really good. Um, you get to feel like you're changing the world for the better by telling the truth, and, and that's that's a really important thing. Um, but my when I first got there, I got there as an intern, um, and I was their bottom of the barrel hire. They'd already hired all their regular interns, and then they got a last minute um, parental leave, and it was the investment reporter. And so they hired this kid at the time. I think I had five dollars and twenty five cents in my checking account, and they hired me to fill in for the investment reporter at the Globe and Mail. I had no idea what the hell I was doing. Um, and that would be sort of a theme for the next 10 years because a lot of times you get dropped into these situations, you have no idea what the hell's going on and you have to make sense of it really, really quickly. Um, that's, that's all really good education uh, for a writer. I got to be around editors who, you know, this guy, Greg O'Neill, who passed away a couple of years ago. But when I showed up, he had been at the Globe for 40 years. And every new hire, he would sit the guy down and he would say, Here's one thing you need to know about how this place works. Uh, all reporters are gods, but all editors are atheists. And that would be his introduction to explaining to you how he was about to cut your copy to shreds uh, and delete every adjective and that sort of thing. Um, all of that was a really good education. And I, 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 I'm glad I did it. And I'm, I'm also glad that I left it when I had a chance. Uh, I'm gonna just actually dive into a question here because Jen has a very, very good question. <laughs> Uh, she wants to know about your unpublished novels, and she wants to know if they were also in the science fiction genre. They were not. They were all over the place. Um, the first one uh, was about a journalist in Toronto who can't stand his job. Uh, that was during my write what you know phase. Uh, the second one was so abstract that I honestly can't give you a, a description of it. Uh, it was it was surreal and it made no sense. Uh, and the third one was supposed to be a comedy, uh, which for anyone who's read American War, um, basically a comedy means only like half the characters die at the end. Um, so it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like the funniest thing in the world. Um, I was just, I, I think of them mostly as, as sit-ups. Uh, you know, I was working the muscles more than anything else. Um, and I was, the fact that I kept writing these novels that absolutely did not work in, in any way, um, but I, that I kept going back to it was kind of, it was proof to me that this is probably what I should be doing with my life. You know, if something kicks your ass, but you keep coming back to it, that's probably where you should be. Um, but it was, I mean, I'm not being sort of self-deprecating or, or, or falsely humble when I say they were unpublishable. These were completely uh, unpublishable novels. Um, but again, it, fiction, fiction is a place where I feel, where I feel comfortable, where I feel like I... I can make the world um, for who I am. Uh, and so that, that's why I spend a lot of my time there. Sorry, I'm just trying to do something admin -y here. I'm trying to mute somebody, but I don't seem to be able to. OK. Um, right, so before we jump into the actual characters and the actual plot of the book, I do, we have some kind of overarching questions for you that were emailed in. and. 
Um, I want to start with this one. It says, is this book supposed to be a cautionary tale for what's bound to come in the not too distant future and what we can do to address it or avoid it? The short answer is no. Um, and, and that's a question that, that is rightly asked about this book a lot. Um, so I started writing the book in the summer of 2014 and I finished the first draft uh, almost exactly a year later, summer of 2015. And about three months, sorry, three weeks after that, Donald Trump announced he was running for president and suddenly the world began to really sort of change. And the book came out, I think three or four months into the new administration. And so as a result, this book that was written well before the Trump era began suddenly starts showing up on these lists of, um, you know, the fiction you need to read to understand the Trump era or like the, the new books of the Trump, that sort of thing, which has been great for book sales, but has done, it has nothing to do with, with what I was thinking about when I was writing the book. Um, I don't think that this is how a second civil war in America would, would happen. Um, the America in which the book takes place is not a literal America. It's an analogous America. The Southerners aren't really Southerners. The Northerners aren't really Northerners. Um, what I did was, was an act of dislocation, was an act of inversion. You know, I took things that are already happening to people on the other side of the planet, people who don't have much of a voice, and I, I recast it in the heart of the world's dominant empire. Yeah. Um, and that's the reason the book had to be set in America. If the book was written 100 years ago, it would probably be called British War. Um, I, I, you know, the story I always go back to as, to as to why this book was written, why I thought I needed to write for this book, has to do with this recollection I have from many years ago now of, um, I was watching this interview, I don't remember if it was on CNN or one of the other news networks, but it was an interview with this foreign affairs expert, you know, one of these people they bring in periodically to, to explain the world. And the interview was taking place in the immediate aftermath of a set of protests that had happened in Afghanistan. Local villagers were protesting against the NATO military presence, in particular, the US military presence. And the question that was put to this gentleman was something like, why do they hate us so much? And as part of his answer, he noted that sometimes the special forces have to go into these villages and conduct nighttime raids looking for insurgents. And that when they do this, they'll sometimes um, ransack the houses or hold the women and children at gunpoint. And then he helpfully added, um, and you know, in Afghan culture, that sort of thing is considered very offensive. And I thought, you know, name me one culture on earth that wouldn't consider this sort of thing offensive. And that's when I first got this notion of, of inversion, of taking these things that are happening to people who don't have much of a voice and making it happen in the loudest place on earth. Uh, the point being to talk about this idea that there is no exotic uh, reaction to, to being on the losing end of a war, that we would all behave the same way. Um, I didn't invent waterboarding. I didn't invent drone killings. I didn't invent refugee camps. I just took these things that are easy for us in this part of the world to ignore, and I, I made them happen as close to home as possible. Um, it's not a particularly clever trick, but it's the one at the heart of, of the book. So by definition, I can't tell you if this, is, if this book is going to predict anybody's future. I can tell you that it's very much based on somebody else's present. That's just it's extremely fascinating. And I, that we had book club last night here in Burlington. And one of the things that came up was, was we talked about camp patients a lot and they were just discussing the tents and how that one night that everything got torn down. And I'm like, I think this is, and like, as you say, like, it's easy for us over here to ignore this, but I'm like, guys, I think this is something that's happening right now all across the world. And we just don't pay enough attention to it. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the two most violent parts of the book and the two parts that were by far the most difficult to write, which is the massacre at Camp Patience and the waterboarding scene, are both, are the two scenes where I effectively changed nothing um, from how it happens in real life. So the, the events in Camp Patience are based on events that happened in a Lebanese refugee camp called Sabra and Shatia. Uh, Sabra is the Arabic word for patience. That's where the name of the camp comes from. Ah, that was a question um, I had. <laughs> and so, you know, all I did was take the eyewitness accounts of what happened the day that the militias overran that camp, and I basically rewrote that. So I didn't change anything. And the waterboarding scene is exactly how that happens. And those were the two most painful scenes. They're the two most gruesome and, and sort of, I think, viscerally off-putting scenes for a lot of readers. 
but they're the ones in which I, I very deliberately change nothing. Um, they're the ones that are closest to, to the way it really works. Wow. Um, Jennifer has a question for you here and I'll just read it here. There are so many political issues that are very divisive in the US right now. Why did you choose big oil as the issue to cause the second civil war? That's a really good question. And my answer is really unsatisfactory and I apologize in advance, <laughs> um, but it's been the same answer since I wrote the damn thing. So I can't, I can't change it now. Um, almost everything that lives in the book is a kind of analogy to something else. Um, and some of these analogies, like the Camp Patience Massacre or like the waterboarding scene, are really, really close uh, to, to the things that they are, are stand-ins for. And some of them are further away. And so when I was looking for the causes of a second civil war, I knew that I wasn't going to find anything of the same magnitude of, of sheer human brutality as the causes of the first civil war. But the idea of climate change and, and the sort of the, the you know, oil use, fossil fuel use, and the climate change that's associated with it seem to work as an analogy to something that many years from now, when it's safe to do so, we'll all be able to stand up and say, I can't believe they didn't realize how wrong they were back then. You know, if it was me, I would have stood up and done something about it. Ignoring that this wasn't some kind of temporary moral oversight, that this was actually the fuel behind a massive commercial empire. And because it made our lives easier and in a sort of aggregate, we were largely willing to turn a blind eye to, to the lives it ruined. So a lot of the things that happen with respect to climate change in the book are analogous much more closely to, to the notion of, of stubbornness, the notion of doing something that's clearly ruinous and clearly destroying another human being's life, um, but saying, you know, this is right because it's always been right and we're gonna do it because we've always done it and that's what makes it, well, that's what makes it correct. Um, I didn't know that when the book came out, you know, it would be right around the time the U.S. pulled out of the Paris Accords, and it would be real easy to read climate change as a very literal thing in, in the book. Um, I, I, I had initially intended it more as a metaphor for, you know, we're going to keep doing this because we've always done this, and that's what makes it right. That's the thing I was trying to get at. Um, I don't know if there's a second civil war in America, whether it would be over climate change. I highly doubt it. But that's, that's sort of where I was coming from. So I have um, some more questions. Um, and I don't think you've actually answered them. And it might be more of your opinion than anything. Um, but is the level of part, partisan, partisan, partisanship, sorry, <laughs> currently going on in the US really leading to the ap apocalyptic world? You know, I, I grew up. So Qatar didn't have, um, didn't have much of, of a kind of internal cultural industries. Uh, we didn't have a movie industry or film industry or, or, you know, many, there wasn't a publishing house. There wasn't really a library when I was growing up there. Um, so all the culture was imported. And as a result, I grew up largely on American culture, American music, movies, books. Uh, a lot of it was censored because it was a heavily censored society. So I still have my um, I was talking about this last night. I still have my two copies of, of um, I was a big Nirvana fan growing up. And so I have my two Nirvana CDs and, and in utero, the, the baby is blacked out. Somebody took a black pen and blacked out the baby and, uh, or sorry, uh, never mind. Um, the baby's blacked out and in utero, the angel on the cover is blacked out. So we have this very censored sort of um, version of American culture. Nonetheless, um, because I had consumed so much American culture, I assumed that I understood this country. And then lo and behold, you know, almost uh, 30 years later, I move here. And every morning I wake up and realize that I don't understand America at all. Um, and, you know, every day something happens that, that causes me to reassess my, my sort of mental model of how this country works. In reality, I don't think that there's anything particularly new about what the Trump administration represents and, and what this moment represents. I just think it's a lot louder. Um, I think it's a much louder version of things that have been happening for decades, if not longer. Uh, and I think a particularly malicious portion of, of the population of this country feels much more free to shout the things that previously they might have whispered. Um, I don't know where that leads. Uh, I would like to think that the, the, the institutions of this country are strong enough to be tested by this and, and not fall apart. 
Um, but I become a little less hopeful of that every day. Um, and I, I genuinely have no idea how this particular moment ends. I don't know what's on the other side of this. So bearing this in mind, what you've just said, I guess my question to you is, are you optimistic? On a personal level, yes. As a novelist, I feel absolutely no, no obligation to, to provide hope or optimism. Okay. Um, it sounds like a cruel thing to say, but, but at any point in a society where you get to a place where you're looking to, your, you know, to the people who make things up, as sources of hope and optimism. <laughs> so, you know, I, at, on a personal level, hopefulness and, and, and optimism for me is a function of survival. Um, the alternative is to just accept a world where many of the most powerful people on this planet would rather someone like me just not exist. Um, and I don't want to do that. And so on a personal level, yes, absolutely. I will hold on to optimism and hope and love and center these things in the way I view the world. But as a novelist, I couldn't have written American War and provided it with, with a sort of, and then everything worked out at the end. You know, like I couldn't have made that the last chapter. And in fact, when we ended up selling the film rights, uh, because I didn't know anything about how that world works, I've never dealt with Hollywood, I've never dealt with, with that industry. I only asked for two things. I ask that they respect the racial backgrounds of the characters. So it's not, you know, starring uh, Taylor Swift, a Surat Chestnut, or, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and the second thing I asked for is that they, um, they not uh, tone it down, that they not turn it into American peace, that they not give it the Disney treatment, that they not do that. Um, maybe, maybe that version of American War is, would, would have been a much better book, but, it, but the book I was trying to write could not center hope fullness and optimism and this very clean conclusion uh, at the end. I, I couldn't do that and write this kind of book. It had to be the way it was. Um, it's so funny because what it just dawned on me is that like your job is to entertain. I mean, people read to be entertained. Um, but I think it's just because the subject matter is really so, like we see such parallels in what you're writing about and what's going on in, in culture today. I mean, the, the truth is, I think you're absolutely right. Um, one of the things that has happened si since I published this book is that I've come to the conclusion that I actually have no idea what my job is as a writer. Um, I, do I don't know if it's to entertain or to inform or to put you in a place where you're uncomfortable. I, you know, a lot of times I get asked, you know, what, what makes a good book? And I have a real hard time explaining what I think makes a good book because I don't know why I love the books I love. You know, the, the closest thing I can come to is is this idea that a really good book is um, is both the lighthouse and the storm. Um, you know, so I, I I think of it that way. But in reality, I I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing as a fiction writer. Um, I write what feels necessary to me, and a lot of times that's that correlates to the things that make me angry. Um, but I'm not sure what what the obligation is on my part. One of the really interesting things that has happened because the book. The book has come out in about 13 languages now, so I've done a couple of book clubs overseas and that sort of thing. And there is a kind of reaction that I get, particularly in North America, which I think is a valid reaction, which is, this book is too dark, it's too painful, it's too much. And I think that is a perfectly valid reaction. But one of the really interesting things is that in no other part of the world has that been the, the sort of default yeah. or even common reaction. And I did a book club uh, with a, a, a meeting with a book club in Egypt where it was the, uh, it was the opposite. Um, I got a bunch of people complaining that I had toned it down too much. Wow. And, well, obviously this is based on Sabra and Shatia. Why did you like, you know, restrain it so much and that sort of thing. So it's been interesting seeing the extent to which people's personal perspectives color um, how they view the work in, in a really sort of absolute sense. Wow. Um, okay, <laughs> so <laughs> let's jump into the actual characters and the plot of the book. We have a lot of questions about that. And the question I was talking about, the one that I have received about six times is, what happened to Mexico? <laughs> um, so I was drawing the, the map. I, uh, when I was writing this, I, had, uh, I was still working at the Globe. And I was, I was living in this place in Southeast Portland. I had a little, I turned one of the rooms in this apartment we were renting into my office. 
and I, I hand drew all of these maps of the US. I got this, I got this massive wall map of, of the United States and I put it on my back wall and I started drawing over it. And I was, you know, I'd, this part goes back to Mexico and this is where the plague happens and this is where the suicide bombing is. Um, tangentially, that actually turned into a bit of an embarrassment for me because at the time I was still working at the Globe and Mail. So I would do these video hits for the Globe website and I did about five or six before I realized that in every one of these, on the back wall, anyone who's watching this video just sees this map that just has like, here's where the suicide bombing is going to happen. And here's where what I, it, it was just a really bad look. <laughs> that I did not realize until way too late in the game. Um, I was partitioning, I was partitioning the United States um, in a way that I think anyone who grew up in my part of the world um, would be familiar with. So, you know, I grew up in a part of the world where about a hundred years ago, a bunch of British and French guys just drew some lines on a map and created very, very arbitrary nation states. And we still live with the results of that. Um, and the United States is a place, I think because of its dominance in the world and, and by virtue of being the world's leading superpower is a place that I think assumes much more stability than, than, than is inherent in the idea of the nation state. So if you open up the book and you see the map on the first page, there's that part called the, the Mexican Protectorate, um, which basically is, you know, this, this part of the United States has become so destabilized that, um, that it not, the Mexicans have taken it over again. Well, that's just what, the real, that's what that map looked like not too long ago that just used to be Mexico. All I did was look at an old map of, of the continent and redraw that line. Um, one of the things I was trying to get at is that the concept of the nation state is a really fluid thing and it changes all of the time um, and it's gonna change again. So I gave a chunk of land back to Mexico, uh, including all that stuff up, up to East Texas or whatever it was. Um, and it, it was, all it was was just the old map redrawn on the new one. All right. That Sorry, answers I that. What happened to Mexico, right? I didn't just like mishear your question and no. go off. Of <laughs> no, no, no. That's, that's exactly it. Everybody wanted to know how Mexico <laughs> took Texas. <laughs> yes, everything went to hell and, and the Mexicans stepped in to, to, to sort of run the affairs uh, of that area. Okay, um, so Sarah, who's actually on the call today, um, emailed me this question. She wants to know if the main character's name is a nod to Confederate diarist Mary Chestnut. Yes, yes it is. Um, Surratt Chestnut is based on, uh, the name is based on two Marys of the Civil War, Mary Surratt and Mary Chestnut. Uh, both of those last names are spelled differently. The, the Marys have slightly differently spelled names. Uh, Mary Chestnut was, um, as Sarah said, a, a diarist who was chronicling the last days of the South during the, the Civil War and, and what it's like to lose the war. Um, uh, Mary Chestnut was a diarist. Mary Surratt was the only woman indicted as part of the um, attempt to, to uh, assassinate Lincoln. Um, so uh, a diarist, an assassin, um, that felt like a good fit for, for this character. And the whole thing with um, Sarah T. Chestnut becoming Surratt Chestnut uh, I stole that from the story of Ulysses S. Grant. I think uh, there, the S doesn't stand for anything, I don't think. The S was a typo, and he was too polite to to correct the person who made it. And so the S just kind of stuck around. Um, so I read up on that, and I, I, I like that. Um, and uh, and I kept it. Uh, I sort of repurposed it for the Sarah, you know, Sarah T. Chestnut Surratt thing. Good knowledge, uh, Sarah. I did not pick up on that at all. <laughs> Um, I do have a question about her name. When we were discussing it yesterday in book club, um, they wanted to know if there was any significance um, because she was uh, like talking about feminism and whether she just didn't like her name as Sarah. Um, is there any significance behind why she chose to keep her name as Sarah? I mean, thematically there was to me. Um... One of the things that happened when I when I moved to this part of the world is suddenly, you know, it was like a million doors opening all at once. It was no longer you would get, you know, three books and they'd all be censored. Suddenly I had access to this entire new world. And I was reading pretty voraciously and I was I was consuming culture um 
to make up for the you know first 16 years of my life when I when everything was censored and heavily controlled. And very quickly, I stumbled onto the writer who who in my mind is is the greatest living writer in the English language, uh, and that's Toni Morrison. Mm. And one of the things that um, that her writing really forced me to think about is the power of names, uh, the names you give yourself and the names you are given, and, and what it means when there's a discrepancy between those two things. What it means when you don't have agency over how it is you are called, you know, how it is you're described, and what it is you're called. Um, this is particularly true in a book like Song of Solomon, uh, which is very much a book about m many things, but, but, but also about the power of names and the names you give yourself and the names you're given. So very early on in the book, it's explained to the reader that this, this is the name this person was given. This is the name she has chosen for herself. And for the rest of the book, we are going with the name that she has chosen for herself because that matters. Mm -hmm. uh, agency matters. Your sense of self matters. Um, you know, I'm, I'm introduced in this part of the world. I'm always introduced as Omar al -Akkad. Um, That's not my name. Uh, my name is Omar Muhammad Laed. It's it's an Arabic name and it's unpronounceable in the English language. It's, it includes Arabic letters that are unpronounceable in English, um, and that's not to say that everybody who who announces me is Omar Laed. Like, I mean, that's what I call myself in this part of the world. But it has to do with this notion of of the splitting off of your identities that you have to do um, when you're in that kind of place. So those were all the things that I was thinking about when I drew this up. Um, but of course, you can't sort of put that in the book in any kind of overt way. So I just, you know, I gave her her given name and she chose her, her the name she wanted to use. And then we went with the name she wanted. Okay. I feel like that's a uh, full answer. <laughs> Sorry, these uh, are very rambling. Feel free to cut me off. I, I, I tend to sort of go. Not, not at all. This is, no, this is really great. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean that to sound <laughs> dismissive at all. Um, Ashley wants to know what was the significance of the relationship between twins? Was it just a way for a way to humanize the twins for Sarat, or a way for her to relate to them? You know, they they showed up as twins. I, I'm an only child, and I, I discovered recently going back on, on looking through my writing. I have my writing saved on my computer since I was about the age of seventeen, um, so it's quite a bit. Um, the second half of my life, effectively. And I found that a lot of my writing has to do with sibling relationships. I think it's just something that I, that I never had. And so I'm, I'm, I'm there mentally a lot of the time, exploring what it might be like. Um, and of course, I get it wrong all of the time because I'm, I'm writing outside of myself, which is the case for a lot of this book. Um, but I, I, I did want to, to have two people who are, who are very, very different uh, in, in their approaches to the world, um, very similar in a number of respects, um, and both of whom fundamentally want the same things. I mean, one of the things I was asked last night, it was a really interesting question. What did Surat need to have a good life? You know, what is it that, that would have worked, that would have made things work out? And my answer to that question is, the same thing every human being, including you and me, would have needed. She didn't need anything special, you know, love, safety, a sense of security. And, uh, and at their core, you know, you have these two sisters who are, who are twins, um, are very different, and yet that's all either of them really want. They go about it, you know, their approaches to it are very, very different. Um, but fundamentally, they, they, they are looking for the same thing. And it's not some exotic, you know, some, some exotic privilege that only a few of us should be allowed. It's just, it's the basic, basic thing. It's, it's a sense of security, a sense of being surrounded by people who love you. Um, you know, for all the, the awful things that, that Surat does in this book, her threshold for damage is incredibly high. You know, the things that need to happen to take her to the place where she ends up are incredibly extreme things. Um, and I, I think, you know, for, for all the differences between, between the sisters, um, I think a lot of them were really superficial. And I, I, had, I had sort of intended to, to try and have a lot of superficial differences between them, but at the end have them be tethered by their love for one another um, and tethered by... by their basic desire for just an, a life without, without injustice, a life without pain. 
Okay, so Ashley's actually um, asked further for further explanation here. She wants mm -hmm. to know specifically why have the male twins at the end, the ones that she spares Martin and Bud. And um, further on to her question, I actually had a question about that as well because, may, sorry, maybe you should answer that and then I'll ask mine. <laughs> Yeah, the twins at the end, uh, there, was, there was obviously a symmetry there, uh, and there was a sense of, of, of not really wanting to spare them until she realizes that, that connection. Um, and the same is true at the very end of the book, where um, you, have, you have the twins manning the, the, uh, the, guard, the guard sort of crossing the, the, the checkpoint. And one of them, as a result of the damage that was inflicted upon him, in that in that moment, when Surat decides to to uh, spare their lives, as a result of that damage, one of them becomes really really mean, and and propagates the cruelty that was inflicted on him, and the other one doesn't, and and the reason for that particular setup is because so much of what happens in this book is driven by misguided, almost luck of the draw kind of cruelty. Um, you know, for, I'm thinking here specifically of of um, the 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 when when Surat is told her sister is killed, and it's basically just a drone uh, randomly dropped a bomb. Um, because so much of the book is driven narratively by by sort of luck of the draw cruelty, um, which is the way it works in wartime in the real world. I wanted the final instance of the book to be. Um, Run of the mill kindness, like sort of luck of the draw kindness, um, because if that other brother had also decided to propagate the cruelty that was inflicted on him, then the sort of cataclysmic event at the end would never have happened. Um, but instead, he decides to defer to kindness, and and the result is is monstrous. The result is is the sort of defining event of the book. So sorry, um, that was that went off on a on a tangent. Um, what was what was the the your semi related question? So funny that you should go off on your tangent because that was my question <laughs> about the um, the twins at the very end. Um, I didn't exactly follow what had happened because it the way that it was written, kind of in the letter or like a net, like it wasn't live at the time. Um, so they they didn't check the rest of the bus, and I thought it. I didn't understand if they recognized her or. Yeah, yeah. The uh, so so that was um, it wasn't a good decision, but it was a deliberate decision on my part. I, I wanted to make it. Um, I, I wanted him. I wanted the guard to to basically have a bad feeling about this one person, and he can't quite put his finger on why he has this bad feeling, which is why earlier in the book I have this really convoluted setup where the twins are tied up and um, they're blindfolded, so they can't quite see who's doing this to them. And so they, they, they don't know her face when they see her later on in the checkpoint. And it's a really sort of convoluted way to get at this moment at the end where one of the twins just sees this person and just has a bad feeling um, and doesn't quite know why. And his, his reaction is to be cruel about it and to be mean about it. And his brother's reaction is to be kind about it. Um, and I wanted to get at this notion that damage affects people different ways. Some people are inf have damage inflicted upon them, and they become people who inflict damage. And some people go through the same experience, and they decide to respond with kindness. And I, I wanted to get at that. But you're absolutely right that the way I present it in the book is about as obtuse as, as humanly possible. This weird source document of Congress people talking about it after the fact. It was... It was a bit much, um, if I'm being if I'm being honest. <laughs> um, okay, so Jen has a question here. Uh, good question, Jen. She said that in her chapters meeting, someone brought up the lack of women in military positions, and it had her wondering if a lack of legitimate pathway for Sarah Surratt to contribute to the war effort was a um, contributing factor to her becoming radical radicalized. Yes, I mean it's a really interesting question. A lot of um, a lot of what is in the book is drawn from things I saw when I was, and I, I don't I don't want to misconstrue and say that I'm I was some kind of you know swashbuckling war correspondent. I was a reporter who spent some time covering wars, um, 
but during all of that time, you would get in this situation where where you, you have the face of war, the face of particularly sort of institutionalized war, systemic war, modern military is a very male face. Um, you know, absolutely, there, there were female soldiers and, and, and that exists, but, but warfare as, as a modern concept was so defined by this, not just this sort of masculinity, but this, this sort of poisoned masculinity. It's hard to explain, but the people who were, who were most confident about this enterprise, and, and I was covering the war in Afghanistan, which is one of the longest running, most sort of futile seeming conflicts, certainly during my time on this earth. Just this conflict that seems to be going nowhere and will continue to go nowhere for a really long time. And, you, and the people who seem to be most confident about how it was absolutely not going nowhere and how things were going great and we're about to turn a corner were always the men. And this book was really focused on that notion, on that notion of um, the, 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 the sort of why it's a necessary pre prerequisite for people who, who, who wage war to have that muscle for, for self-delusion, um, to be able to convince themselves no matter how terribly things are going, no matter how many lives are being lost, no matter how ruinous everything is, that this is going to turn out fine if we just persevere. And the attitude, when I saw that attitude, I almost universally saw it um, with, with male members of the military. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. Certainly, I don't think Surratt had a real chance to, to participate in, in a sort of formal military um, endeavor. Because by the time the book starts, you know, the South loses the war very, very quickly. And so what you're in by the time Surratt is aware of her surroundings is not really a war so much as an insurgency. And so if you're going to join that kind of effort, you're not going to join a regular military to begin with. You're going to join a very irregular military. And in fact, most of the things that happened to Surratt in, in Sugarloaf are predicated on the notion that she's not a member of, of a regular military. The same way that people who are waterboarded in Guantanamo Bay, uh, it's predicated on the notion that they are not military members, they're unlawful combatants or whatever the euphemism is these days. Um, so I was thinking a lot about those things when I was constructing the military makeup in, in, um, in American War. Okay. Um... Kate would like to know how you decide, how or why perhaps, um, you decided to start from Benjamin's point of view instead of Sarah telling the story directly. Yeah, that's another really convoluted, convoluted part of the book. Um, <laughs> technically, it's first person, but for the vast majority of the book, it's actually sort of third person. Um, I wanted to tell the story from the point of view of somebody who was thinking a lot about agency and thinking a lot about how they didn't have control over the fundamental and defining events of their life. Um, so, you know, Benjamin, towards the end of the book, he's read the diaries and he's constructed the events of what happened based on the diaries. And then he goes and burns the diaries, which is this really futile thing. It, it's, it's almost a gesture of impotence more than anything else. But he says, you know, this is the only way, the closest I was ever going to come to hurting her, or the only way I had to hurt her. Um, I wanted that to be the point of view of the person telling the story because so much of the book is about what happens when you take agency away from people. I think all human beings have a fundamental desire to, um, to have some say over the things they do and the things that are done to them. And, and really bad things happen when you take that away. And so I wanted the person telling the story to be wrestling with um, what to do when someone takes that agency away, with, uh, away from you. And in a sense, he represents the closest the book comes to hopefulness because, you know, Surratt had her agency taken away and she responded with the violence of warfare um, and physical violence. And he responds with, with intellectual violence and, and sort of documenting it uh, as a form of, of not so much getting his revenge, but as, as a form of making peace with what happened. So that's why he had to be the one to tell the story. I wanted somebody who was aware of what happened, but couldn't do anything about it. 
Um, but Benjamin was my favorite. Um, and when we talk about um, protagonists that we like, um, somebody brought up the Hunger Games in, in a meeting. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure you've heard it before, but they, Katniss, everybody loves Katniss and you just grow to love her and more and more and more. Now, Sarat was not this kind of um, character. Can you discuss that a little bit? Because it sounds like everything you've done in this book is very purposeful. So this was definitely um, not an oversight. <laughs> so why, why the character was constructed the way, the way she is, isn't it? So, yeah, why, why didn't you make her into somebody that we could love and kind of like get behind? <laughs> I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to say anything bad about The Hunger Games because that's an incredible piece of narrative. Um, sure. And, and uh, it's a great piece of storytelling. Um, it's not the kind of book I wanted to write. Right. Um, I would be living in a much nicer house if I had succeeded in writing that kind of book, but it wasn't the book that I wanted to write. Um, what I wanted was a human being who was fundamentally curious about the world, fundamentally loving, um, intelligent, incredibly strong. And I wanted to take that person and show how they can be transformed. Um, so, you know, when we first meet Surat, she is endlessly curious about the world around her. And she's also endlessly trusting. She believes what people tell her about the world around her. And every time she's subjected to damage over the course of the book, her circle of trust gets a little bit smaller. Uh, at first, it encompasses everyone, and then just her family, and then just uh, certain members of her family. And by the end of the book, the only thing it really encompasses, the only thing she trusts anymore, is her own sense of revenge. So she's no longer a partisan. She's no longer a Southern nationalist or whatever you want to call her. She's a nihilist. Um, and all I wanted by the end of the book, I didn't want a character that you would like. I didn't want a character that you would apologize for. Um, I wanted someone who, I wanted you to understand how she gets to the place she ends up. Uh, because when we talk about radicalization, when we talk about extremism, we usually only look at the finish line. You know, we look at, what these people do when they've done whatever horrible thing they're going to be remembered for. And American War is really about the rest of the race. It's about everything leading up to the finish line. It's about how somebody becomes that person. And so I don't want people, I don't like Surratt by the end of the book. I love her dearly, but I don't like her. Um, and I didn't want people to like her. I just wanted them to understand how she gets to the place where she ends up. And the construction of the character is really, and the construction of the narrative is really based on that notion of don't feel you need to take a side, just understand how this got to be the place where it ends up. I think it was incredibly um, powerful telling it from, from a character like her. Um, on a lighter note, <laughs> um, we do have a very good question. And I think it's a very good question because um, Sarah is, is she 6'4", six, 6'5"? Six, <laughs> I can't oh, remember. So, um, four in my head, but yes, I, I don't know if I ever make that clear. So Jessica wants to know, and you, you did discuss that the um, film rights have been, have been sold for this. So Jessica wants to know who is going to play Sarah in the movie. If I'm, I mean, you don't have to tell us if it's been cast, but just uh, in your mind, who would be a good, <laughs> a good actress? It hasn't been cast. Uh, a screenplay exists. And I think they've just, I, maybe this week have just started shopping it around. Um, the way movie options work is that when you sell the option, uh, you get a little bit of money. And if they make the movie, if they exercise the option, you get a ton of money. So I'm sitting here with this lottery ticket in my pocket waiting to see if they actually make this thing. But you buy a, you buy a movie option for, you know, a few thousand dollars. If you make a movie, you're spending between 30 and a hundred million dollars if you're making right. one of these Hollywood films. So the chances of it actually being made are very, very slim. Um, I don't know who's going to pony up that kind of money for an incredibly controversial piece of work. Um, Hollywood doesn't bet on stuff like this very often. Anyway, um, I, um, like most writers, signed away my life when I signed this, this, this um, option agreement. So I have no say over anything. They, can, they promised me that they would respect the, the, uh, the racial background of the characters. A couple of, when I made that, when I made that stipulation, 
a couple of the production studios that were in the bidding for it walked away, um, which gives you a sense of how Hollywood worked. They were like, no, no, if we can't put like Tom Hanks in this movie, we're, we're, we're out, you know, that sort of thing. Um, they're, they're very sort of honest about that in a really gross kind of way. Uh, anyway, uh, I, if I had my choice, uh, everybody in this movie, uh, certainly in Surratt's role and the central roles would be new, would be non-established characters, uh, non-established actors. Um, partially because off the top of my head, there are very few people who, who fit the sort of physical requirements of many of the characters in this book, but also because it's not like other things. Like, I don't know if American War is a good or bad book, but it's not like other books, certainly in that kind of genre and in that kind of world. And so it seems like it would be a good, a good vehicle for somebody to, you know, something new. I, 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 would, I would be really happy if somebody you've never heard of showed up as Surat Chestnut. That would, that would make my day. I like that answer. Um, I have a question about um, your dedication in the book. It is written to your dad. Can you tell us anything about your dad? Yeah, my dad, um, when he was young, let's see if I get through this. This is gonna be, this is gonna be touch and go. Um, so my dad, uh, when he was young, he grew up in Egypt and he, he marinated in Egypt. I mean, he loved that country. He knew all the poets, the singers, the writers. And when he was a little kid, he grew up in El Hussein, which is the old part of Cairo, the really old part of Cairo. And uh, every, I think it was Thursday night or something, he would sneak into one of the coffee shops where Naguib Mahfouz, who's this giant of Arab literature, he's the only Arab writer to have won the Nobel Prize, would hold court and discuss the sort of issues of the day. Um, and the owner of the coffee shop would let him sit there and um, listen in until the conversation got too raunchy, and then he would kick him and the other kids out. Um, and he was, you know, his love of that world is where I got my love for literature from. Um, and he died young. He died at 56. Yeah. Um, which was nine years ago. Um, and I don't, I don't know if he would have liked this book. I think, I, I think secretly he would have probably hated this book, but <laughs> none to, have, um, to have pulled it off. I th it meant something to me, you know, I, for whatever that's worth. And you have children of your own. I do. We had our first daughter um, two weeks after the book came out. Oh, wow. In April. That was, uh, it's been a busy year and a half ever since. I guess so. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Well, we have no more questions for you this evening, but I just want to thank you so much. And I mean, you talk about it being a good book or a bad book. And I, personally, I fell in love with it. I thought it was fabulous. <laughs> and it really, if it did nothing else, it made everybody really, really think and really question. And that's what we, that's what we want to do. Um, Ashley? has just written that she loved this book as well. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. I really, really appreciate it. And I appreciate you all taking the time to, uh, to talk to me. Well, thank you um, for taking the time to talk to us. And um, even if it got a couple people out of their genre, their normal genres, then uh, we did our job. <laughs> thank no, you, ladies, it. for joining us. And uh, we hope to see you soon. And um, sorry, one last question. Do you have anything on the works? Are you, are you writing the next one? I wrote the next one. Um, it, yeah. it exists. Um, I found out uh, 48 hours ago that it might actually become a real thing, that it might actually see the light of day. Um, and I will say nothing else about it because it's going to have to go through 400 more drafts <laughs> uh, before it's even remotely usable. So, uh, well, well, we look forward to seeing whatever is next from you. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Omar. Thank you. Bye-bye.